Hello and welcome back to this dumb philatelistic crusade. I'm the Mush Picture Analyst, and this commentary track will be for the 1942 masterpiece, Cat People, the first of the nine Val Luton-produced B-horror films made for RKO in the 1940s, which in their production completely revolutionized uh, the entire concept of what a horror film could be and could contain, and they remain as part of the Luton canon, as I like to refer to them, some of the most intricately produced, absolutely exquisite films to ever come out of the Hollywood studio system. And they remain a true artistic triumph of the entirety of the horror genre. And there is literally nothing else in the world quite like the Val Luton horror films. In this commentary, I will try to not cover a lot of the same ground that's pretty much been uh, perfectly covered by others. There are already two absolutely fantastic commentaries for Cat People, one by Greg Mank on the uh, Warner Brothers DVD and Criterion Blu-ray, and then another excellent commentary by Bruce Eater on the original Criterion Laserdisc release all the way back from 1994. And so, of course, with any commentary, I'll probably wind up covering some of the same materials, but I will try to give my own particular readings on the film uh, because the Luton films are special in that they are some of the rare films that warrant such repeat viewings that they are experiences to be had over and over again. Uh, they, they are joys to return to because you cannot quite grasp the, the full intricacies of, of each and every scene and every uh, completely rendered character on that first initial viewing. And, and they so stick in the mind that uh, if you are a lover of the Luton films, you don't just love them, you absolutely adore them. And uh, the, the entire work of the man himself and the absolutely astonishing uh, production team he was able to pull together to make these films. Uh, the, the team is part of the magic of the Luton canon or the Luton cycle of horror films. RKO simply wanted a film to compete with Universal's uh, re-jump-starting of, of their monster films, uh, primarily uh, after the massive success of 1941's The Wolfman, which uh, Cat People was essentially birthed into existence to try to literally cash in on that market, right down to having a similar sort of lycanthropy-based thematic to it, even though, of course, it is a you know Cat People instead of The Wolfman. It is a little bit obvious. RKO was reeling after the one-two punch of non-financial successes that Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre had produced in Citizen Kane and The Magnificent Ambersons. And although Ambersons was really primarily the, the studio's fault for completely butchering and not giving a chance to, they viewed the whole Welles uh, affair as an experiment of the previous regime under George Schaefer, former head of RKO, who was now out by this time. And the new uh, line at the studio was uh, showmanship in place of genius. And, of course, that was a uh, knock against Wells. Wells is supposed genius not making money for the studio and only causing them massive financial losses and uh, rather notoriety they were not quite looking for at the time. So Luton was brought into the fold to produce these horror films in the B unit division and given very strict... Uh, very definite rules, primarily three rules, which are very well known among most horror aficionados, even if you haven't seen the Luton films. I think most people have a general idea that in these films, they had very little money, which was literally $150,000 was the maximum budget. The films could not run longer than 75 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes, and then they would be assigned titles at the start of production. So Luton would be handed a tested title that was supposedly foolproof, according to the RKO sales boys, and then had to make the film around it. And, of course, RKO expected it to be something akin to the Universal Horror Films. But the genius in what Luton did was to realize that, you know, he couldn't do a Universal film with the budget he had, and he didn't really want to because they had gotten, in his opinion, stale by that point in time and had really lost the initial magic of the 1930s and what we now term the golden age of horror films, which is absolutely true. And I do love some of the later 1940s Universal films, but you, you can't deny the fact that, that that initial spark was gone, which also ha- had to be because the production code had come into place in 1934 and Universal had changed hands. So it was really a different company entirely and uh, no longer were the horror films anything quite like the original Universal horror films that made the studio famous under the, the limit family, primarily uh, spearheaded under the uh, triumphant, uh, majestic horror films directed by James Whale. What they didn't also count on was the fact that Luton was a poet and a, an extremely well-read literate man, a genius in his own way, and somebody who had worked under David O. Selznick for nearly a decade by this point. So Luton knew 
the film world inside and out. He knew what made a movie tick. He knew what made a movie work. He knew every single aspect of the production world because, again, he had just come from almost a decade of being David O. Selznick's right-hand man, which speaks volumes because few, if any, people could ever keep up with the absolutely insane workload that David O. Selznick put on himself and his absolute obsessive attention to detail, which is something that I think Luton already had in himself and uh, something he carried on to these films, which is why they, they feel so exquisitely crafted with such intensive care, even when when you look at the nine films, there is some slight change-ups in terms of crew, so they all have slightly different feels, but they all have that internal, absolutely exquisite attention to detail and character, which is why these films are, are known as, as if, if there is an auteur of this, it is the producer, not the director, because Luton would also rewrite the final draft of the screenplays himself and not take credit for it. And and I think it's this most of all, his his actual writing on, on the scripts and his polishing and his doing the final polished draft work that gives them the unified feel uh, on the script page itself. And of course, the script is the backbone of any film, and so that just leeches in and becomes the soul of the film itself on the, on the page. And the fact that you have the same person performing this duty and being the producer, the hands-on producer on the set every single day, it, it can't help but become the the soul of the film. So you know, if 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 the auteur theory is to be upheld here, it, it is definitely that that notion of the producer auteur, which is a very rare thing. As I mentioned before, there are nine of the Luton horror films that were produced from 1942 to 1946, and the, he did manage to do a handful of other films while at RKO with some of the same team. And then uh, after this point, he was never able to reach the same level of artistic success at other studios. He, he kind of found himself floundering a, a little bit and really couldn't find another niche, especially without his original uh, production team of, of the RKO horror films. And he would have most likely gone on to greater, uh, well, further successes with Stanley Kramer, but unfortunately he died of heart trouble at a very young age. So really the greatest shame is that uh, Luton was never able to have the same level of success as the horror films or the same level of uh, creative freedom and creative excitement and fulfillment from making these films and also never really lived to see that they would get rediscovered and uh, fully appreciated and admired by generations to come in the future. When examined closely, the nine Luton films, while they do have a central, a shared amount of central themes and they do feel linked in, in a number of ways, they are all distinctly different from one another. But I like to think they sort of fall into three film cycles. So you have the first three films directed by Jacques Tourneur to the middle three films where they try different ideas and Mark Robeson steps up to the director's chair from the editor's bench, along with Robert Wise as well and Gunther von Fritsch. And then the last three films, all starring Boris Karloff, sort of form their own little three-film arc. So if you were to try and find a way in which the, the cycle of nine films overall, how they rise and fall, sort of, you can, I think, look at them in sort of these three-film arcs and, and sort of look at them that way. But uh, overall, they do form their own particular canon of these nine 75-minute uh, or less films that are truly one of a kind. And I think it, it speaks volumes that uh, both Jacques Tourneur and Robert Wise would later return to similar films later on in their careers, uh, much, much later on, that were acknowledged and designed uh, as a complete not just a tip of the hat, not just flexing old muscles, but an absolute love letter to their time with Val Luton and the RKO Horror Unit. Jacques Tourneur with 1957's masterpiece, Night of the Demon, uh, which has uh, his his style uh, that he developed with Val Luton on the three horror films they did in this time period, starting with Cat People, written all over it. And then Robert Wise would later make the 1963 film The Haunting, which is very much inspired by his time in the Val Luton Horror Unit. 
But all of this starts with 1942's Cat People. Had this film not been successful, it would be rather unlikely that the cycle would have continued or with the same level of creative freedom and in the same artistic-minded direction of making the best film as humanly possible with the constraints given that Luton was so feverishly devoted to. This is a very special film that I wanted to do this commentary for because I feel most times people are are fascinated by the shock and scare sequences, and with good reason, because they were revolutionary. But frequently, it is less often that people discuss the intricate design of the characters and virtually every single shot and sequence of this film, which is absolutely remarkable. And it is one of those rare films, as I said before, with the entirety of the Luton horror canon, that remain absolute artistic triumphs, works of art that are both chilling to the very marrow of one's bones and yet also gut-wrenchingly, heart-wrenchingly, emotional journeys of, of the human spirit and the absolute horrors that are faced in general society. There are no villains in the Luton horror canon, only human beings and their struggles to simply survive. Uh, whether or not they found themselves uh, by the end of the film is is up to them and their particular journey. But all are deeply realized, fully dimensional human beings. Uh, the, the notions of good and evil exist in the Luton Horror canon, but there are no heroes and there are no villains. They are truly, in that sense, not just striving to be, but achieve a certain level of realism, which was the entire goal that uh, Luton set out on when he realized that he couldn't beat Universal at their own game, and he didn't really want to anyway, that the best way to utilize his talents and the talents of his team that he had assembled would be to bring horror back to a more believable state by bringing things into the modern day, into the everyday, and to feature and focus intelligent, realistic, grounded characters that the audience could then become accustomed to and actually care for. And so when the horror element comes in, because the audience actually cares for these people, not just characters, but people by this point, that magnifies the horror and actually gives it a reason to be there and to be felt because by this point we actually care for these people on the screen and what happens to them. So that's my little introduction to try to get into the commentary for this film. And again, uh, if you have not heard the two official audio commentaries on the Criterion Blu-ray, Warner DVD, and the Criterion Laserdisc, they're an absolute must-listen and excellent commentaries by which this track is merely an informal uh, perspective from a great admirer of, of the entire body of work that uh, Val Luton left behind, and of these films in particular, which are absolute treasures of the medium. So uh, please, if you wish to sync this up with a particular copy of the film, go ahead and queue it up to the uh, zero minute, zero second mark. Uh, there should be a little bit of black area just before the iconic bleeping antenna RKO logo. And that way we should be able to get on a similar page and do a rough sync. And keep in mind, this is, is, is not professionally recorded, so this will just be as, as best as possible. But you should be able to figure out if we're in the same place or not, we should all be relatively on the same page if we start at the uh, zero minute, zero second mark right before the RKO logo appears. So with that, head to your copy of the film and I'll do a brief count in. So go ahead and have it queued up to the zero minute, zero second mark and we will get started. So in five, four, three, two, one, press play now. We have the iconic RKO bleeping opening logo and the first strains of an ominous feeling with Roy Webb's scoring coming in. And Roy Webb, even though he was the music department head at RKO, would compose really intricate, wonderful scores for the Luton films. Uh, B films at RKO would typically have you know, source music or track cues, so it was uncommon for them to seek out and actually have original scores. That's just another part of what elevates the Luton canon of B-horror films above others. Also, you see the main cast of the Luton team appear for the first time. Cinematography by the incredible Nicholas Musaraka, Mark Robeson as editor. A nice musical flourish for Val Luton, as all his producing credits would have under Roy Webb's scoring. 
the credit for DeWitt Bodine as writer and Jacques Tenor as director, all over a rather ominous but fitting first glimpse of the cat on the screen inside Arena's apartment. And then this opening text, all again over elements of Arena's apartment, over the figure of the spearing of the cat, we have this quote from a fictional book by the doctor of the film, Dr. Lewis Judd. So it's already building a sense of a world, but of course a little bit of fourth wall breaking because it's acting as if we're reading from something that Dr. Judd actually got to publish, which is just a nice touch of adding a level of intelligence to open the film, but also building one of the characters we won't even meet for a significant period of time. And we're immediately right into business with no time wasted because, of course, this is a B film first and foremost. They only have an hour and 15 minutes to play with. And already we are in the sort of meat cute of the film where uh, Kent Smith is Oliver Reed, which is, of course, funny because we all think of the great actor Oliver Reed to come later. And the first time he meets Simone Simone's Irena Dubrovna and this rather intricate looking set which is actually a holdover from a Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers musical the last time we really saw this set it was Fred and Ginger skating around and it's amazing when you realize some of the things that the Luton team would reuse this just being one uh, that we will come to just in in just a moment the most famous reused element in any of the Luton films but it's interesting to see just how quickly and how naturally this meet cute is the meet cute being a staple of boy meets girl girl meets boy and you can already tell a spark and connection is there here you have that but it's treated extremely realistically and it's all the more believable for it there's an added dimension already to the characters and they've just started speaking arena's not just standing around she's drawing and she doesn't want people to see her drawings and she can't admit to any of them being great and keeps tearing all of them up and it's this action of her littering that brings oliver reed over to her in the first place and also is an action that for the first time shows how Irena draws Oliver to her without even trying, and this notion that Oliver feels continually drawn towards her. It's another element that we see here with the paper blowing around, which reveals what Irena was drawing. We see the cat being speared through by a sword blade, which is ominous the first time you see it, but you don't know what it means. Once you see the film the second time, that becomes an an absolute even greater omen of impending doom and darkness, which is a feeling that you get in all of the Luton horror films, that there is a sense of impending doom. There is the ever spectral feeling of death itself haunting everyone and everything that goes on. But what's something I've always felt really interesting, once you notice it, especially here in Cat People, there are many elements that are set up multiple times actually and then followed through on so it builds right there with the picture of the cat being speared by the blade it is of course how arena herself will perish and we see in her apartment the figure of the cat being speared just setting that idea up in the audience's mind multiple times and then following through and now we have the line about the brownstone front, which, of course, is uh, doubly ironic by the fact that the famous staircase from the Mag- Magnificent Ambersons appears and is reused here you, to incredible effect. One often wonders how, how well-paying Irina's job must be <laughs> as a fashion designer to uh, be able to afford to live in a, a remnant of the Ambersons mansion. But it's a uh, beautiful, dark figure into this uh, otherworldly type place that leads to Arena's apartment. And it almost gives the sense, due to her uh, intensive, uh, repressive feeling, that she is almost the uh, princess figure locked away in the ivory tower. So there is an element of the fairy tale that always creeps into the Luton film, some more than others. But it's that element of the dreamlike, which, which we feel here when Oliver first smells Arena's perfume. Again, something else that will come up in the film later. There are so many elements that are, are set up. Here we get our, our second glimpse of, of the statue with the figure of the, of the king stabbing the cat and piercing it on his sword blade. We see uh, Nicholas Muzuraka's absolutely incredible talent for creating deep shadows. And the, the shadows are key to the Luton idea of, of the most terrifying thing in the world being the fear of the unknown. And since they had no money and they couldn't afford to have monsters or monster makeup, they had to use what they had, which was nothing. And he was absolutely correct in that assumption. Also a great little sort of 
almost cynical, witty in-joke is we immediately fade into this and we see the darkness and the characters are slowly revealed, almost to suggest at first, at a brief fleeting moment, that perhaps they've just you know spent the evening or the afternoon making love. But of course, this is not at all what's happened because then they're revealed and then Irena says, I forgot, it's gotten so late. I like the dark. It's friendly. One of the many telling and deeply profound things that uh, it, many of the, some of the characters utter in this film that are all deeply personal it, and things that at first seem a little off or a little strange or, or a little interesting. But uh, the more times you see the film and the more you study the characters and you become emotionally involved in the story that's being told and, and their various plights and hangups, it's little moments like that that become not just endearing, but add to the the great emotional quality of this film and the, the real tragedy of, of Irena's story. And of course, she's not really doing herself any favors, because if you look all over the apartment, there is cat paraphernalia everywhere, from the painting behind her featuring cats, from the screen that featured in the title sequence, to the figure of the cat speared upon the sword, right down to some of the lighting and some of the other background figures. There are cats everywhere, all over the place. This, of course, is also mirrored by the fact that uh, in most films with this sort of setup of the idea of the cat people, that you would have actors strutting around the set trying to be as outwardly cat-like as possible, which would, of course, either push the film into camp humor or complete ludicrousness. But here, there are so many subtle little uh, attenuations and, 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 and nudges in Simone Simone's performance. Uh, she was known for being a very sensual actress and very striking with, with a sort of cat-like sensibility that Luton first thought of for the character of Irina. No, never did he think he could actually get Simone Simone for this part. But I think Tenora doubled down in the direction of encouraging Simone to have these little moments of almost cat-like tendencies. So if you look at the way that Arena moves around and the way that she interacts with Oliver, it, she is deeply desiring for some sort of physical and emotional connection to other human beings. But quite frequently, the way that she's spaced away from him and the way that she almost toys with him and the way that she looks at him, it's almost as if it's a cat with a new toy that it wants to play around with. There's a lot of, of little subtle touches like that throughout the film that become magnified as, as Arena's passions and jealousy start to come through later on in their relationship. But even some of her, her little facial mannerisms, the way she'll hold her eyes and the way that she'll pause like here, and she just gives that little smile with absolutely no dialogue, and then she looks after Oliver as he leaves, Again, that notion of her being sort of locked away in the tower sort of figure in, a, in another kind of world in the middle of New York City itself. So it is the dreamlike within the, the completely realistic that gives it that otherworldly uh, quality. You'll also notice in terms of the editing, Cat People has a number of fades uh, like we see there. That, of course, was a, a typical transitional device of classic Hollywood. And eventually the Luton films would uh, develop a technique. They started on the next film, and I Walked With a Zombie, where instead of having a lot of fades, they uh, will, Mark Robeson and Luton and later and Robert Wise as well, would focus typically on a signature element. Uh, we see it in the figurehead uh, uh, from the uh, slave ship, and I walked with a zombie. And then uh, later on in one of the uh, statue heads in Isle of the Dead and the Hogarth prints in uh, Bedlam, but uh, using that as, as a moment to sort of not quite freeze frame, but almost focus uh, on, on a particular item instead of having a number of fades. But here the, the, the fades not only suggest the passage of time, but also adds to that, that sort of dreamlike quality. It lets you know that there is something else lurking behind an otherwise completely believable environment. Here we see Oliver's workplace. We're meeting the rest of his his work friends, the Commodore. Uh, then, uh, the, of course, meeting Alice for the first time, played wonderfully by Jane Randolph, one of the great heroines of 1940s films. And f from here we have what is really one of many iconic set pieces from the film, that only grow in stature the more times you see this. There, Simone gets down to encounter the cat for the first time. You can see there's almost a cat-like innocence, and then she forces a smile, and of course the cat doesn't like her. And of course the cat liked Alice in the office. 
But it's it's little subtle moments like this that first start to uh, underline the the uh, the strange qualities of this this creature that Oliver Reed has encountered. That Irena is not quite like anyone else he's ever encountered. And as he says later on, he feels himself literally drawn towards her because of that difference. He is attracted to her simply because she is so strikingly different and strange and exotic, for lack of a better term. And this brings us into one of the great set pieces of the film that has become iconic in its own right. Oliver and Arena return to the pet shop to return the cat. And as soon as Arena enters, the entire store goes insane. The genius of Cat People was to suggest the horror, to not make it uh, so overt. So here, it's moments like this that at first almost scream, oh, there's something wrong with this girl. But it is quickly explained away by the, the lady owner of the pet shop explaining how there have been others who have come in who are just simply not right. They might be good people, but they're simply not right. So Irena must just simply be one of these. These films, in addition to their intricate photography, also have an amazing usage of sound, uh, which frequently gets brought up in the horror sequences. But you can even see it here where... The level of the rain has been brought up because they've gone back outside because they couldn't actually hear each other speak due to the screeching pets inside. And then the other, the sound payoff when she opens the door, peaceful as my dream of heaven, we hear all the tranquil animals inside because Irina is no longer inside. This will be the first place I'll mention this, but every single character in a Luton film, right down to these small character parts that only have one scene, are so fully realized that they feel like real people. There is no small part in a Luton film. There really isn't, because every character is so finely drawn that, again, they feel like real people. This feels like a real pet shop with a real little old lady owner that you could wander into on a rainy night in New York. And, of course, all of us know where this is going, giving a bird to a cat. <laughs> the, this poor bird is not long for this world. Again, another fade into the beautifully lit, dark up, uh, apartment of Arena. And then in a, one of the great moments of cat-like behavior, Arena has just been observing Oliver as he slept and watching him breathe just as a cat does. So it's, it's a lot of these little subtle things that you may not pick up the first time. And again, the, the cat on the screen in the background and also the chair behind Arena, if you look, uh, very, very consciously has been lit to cause a shadow to where the actual wings of the chair cause a sort of cat-like ears to appear on the shadow itself. There is not one wasted frame in Cat People or any of the Luton films. Just the attention to detail, the level of quality, only uh, serve to enhance the drama. Because here, Arena is wanting to literally be a completely emotional human being as she feels she can be. But it is her fear of what lurks inside her, uh, whether it be, be the uh, supernatural folklore of her childhood that was drilled into her, or if there is a literal cat demon that is within her. And it's that indecision that is written all over her face. But also, interestingly... She never actually says this out loud. It's other characters who speak about her fears. And it, it, it's a very bold choice, but also serves to not belittle her fears by having all this happen off screen. It not only saves time, but it also means that there was a point at which Arena has to open up to people and we totally understand that how how weighty this has been on her soul and how hard it is for her to do this. And, and this, the central phrase of her entire character that she repeats many times throughout the film, again, setting up this idea, she says to multiple characters, I have never lied to you. I have not lied to you. And she doesn't. She has her own particular truth, and she sticks to it 
whether you know it's it's going to eventually be her destruction or or her salvation is is entirely up to the people around her and here the the rather stoic and almost seemingly simple-minded Oliver has just expressed his desire to not just his desire but the fact that they are going to marry and you can see on Arena's face that she knows where this could lead. Again, Cat People is a film that only grows in magnitude and its impact the more that you see it. Because on the second viewing, this scene of, of the wedding feast on the night of their wedding that has all the appearance of being wonderful and happy and joyous, you know exactly where this is going. And it is beyond doomed. There is an ominous quality that is here over the beautifully realized dinner table scene with with the wonderful jovial banter back and forth that feels again fully realized because even a, a small character part like this of the head of the office is actually played by Jack Holt father of Tim Holt who was a great uh, known star and owed RKO another film so if Val Luton was able to get a known face into his film and, you know, actually get away with not having to pay a star fee. And we get our first glimpse of Elizabeth Russell over there, who was a sort of muse of Luton's, who appeared in a great number of the Luton films and had such an uh, intensive presence that did already suggest the notion of, of a cat-like grace. So the fact that she is playing the supposed other Catwoman that feels a kinship with Arena speaks volumes here when she makes her appearance and everything stops everyone freeze, freezes Arena looks absolutely in shock and then the Catwoman says my sister but it's dubbed over in Simone Simone's voice uh, underlining this notion of kinship and it's a completely beyond eerie moment that literally freezes you the audience and everyone at the table until she exits, the door closes, and only then does everybody react and come back to life. They've all been frozen in that moment with us for that particular instant. And Arena will never be quite the same after that shock. You can see it completely in her face. And knows now the complete level of danger that she has entered herself into. And here is really the first mention of the cat people, where it's Oliver who brings it up because she's told him about her fears, and he brushes them off as mere superstition, not knowing the extent to which they haunt her. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the incredibly wonderful Alan Napier here, who was a great friend of Luton's and appears in a number of the Luton films, who was a wonderful actor who never really got uh, the, the great parts he deserved until he was uh, given his most iconic role as uh, Alfred the Butler on the classic Batman 66 series. And here, the newlyweds are left alone in the beautifully snowing night streets of New York. There's nothing quite like old-school MGM or RKO snow of the 1930s and 40s. It's got the slight element of the unreal that makes it so vivid in the mind. Beautifully lit close-ups of the fact that Arena wants to be Mrs. Reed and everything that the word means. Of course, meaning actually participating in the typical idea of the honeymoon night or the wedding night but being unable to. So this is really, in a lot of ways, talking about sexual dysfunction in a way that could not at all ever be mentioned, let alone even hinted at in a film of this time under the production code. It's the subtlety of, of the film and the writing and the characterizations and the emotional nuance and depth that allowed this to just completely slip by the censors. And it, it remains to this idea of, is this all in Arena's head? Is it her own fears that are, are hanging her up from being able to physically be with her husband in addition to just being emotionally in love with him? But also, it could be that she literally is a cat demon, that she fears not only what will happen to her, but her destruction of the very thing that she loves. And then this incredibly beautiful, heartbreaking moment where she she almost gives in. She reaches up and her hand almost touches the doorknob until she hears the howls of the panther in the zoo. And 
And again, the usage of the snow on the through the window, just another added element, not only keeping continuity, but adding to the sort of doomed, haunted fairy tale notion that 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 really pervades the film. Then another usage of fade, and we have a complete return to normality with the zookeeper here. Again, another completely fully realized character that is nothing more than a bit part. But also, uh, it's it's a very transition transitionary role that also serves to further Irena's characterization and how a supposed normal person would interact with her and her apparent fascination with the fellow inside, who of course is actually Dyton. It was named Dynamite. That was the name of the cat that was provided. So I don't know if there are any zookeepers in 1942 that are going to be prone to quoting Bible passages. <laughs> but, you know. It also must be said how or here Arena is pacing back and forth just like the cat inside, observing it. And of course, dressed in a beautiful black coat with black gloves and black heels. <laughs> so Here is a really beautiful moment you don't notice the first time. You see the shadow of the birdcage with the bird directly over the mouth of the cat on Arena's screen there, of the, of the leopard. So literally as if the, 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 the leopard or the panther is going to eat the bird, who of course is about to perish itself at the hands of Arena. So it's, it's a, another little visual flourish. And there you see Arena literally stretch her limbs like a cat. It's impossible to not notice these. They, they had to be intended because they're all over. And here you see it again when Arena decides she wants to play with her bird. The sort of look that comes over her face, the way she puts her hand in with her nails, almost seeming like claws. And then the bird starts to fly around in absolute terror. And you see the look on Irena's face, that, that's her, that sort of grin until she freezes and we play it out on her face and only then see the bird has died. Not because Irena did anything to it, but the bird has died in literal terror of her. Roy Webb score underlining the emotion and the depths of Arena's sadness. And again, all this is heightened the more times you see the film because you know just how lost and alone and forlorn that Arena feels and that this is what she thinks will happen to Oliver if she ever even begins to acknowledge her, her deep emotions or, or her physical desires to be with him beyond anything that she has already. Already she feels she has gone past a point of, of a sense of danger of, again, not just for herself, but primarily for him and for others. And it's this, this sadness that is all she has to live with because she knows that she cannot ever be that close to anyone ever. And so what does she do with the bird? She feels compelled to take it to a destructive force she takes it back to the park and then when she throws it to the cat you see the look on her face she has to watch but then her human side as it were that that disgust she has a little shiver and then walks away before watching it being consumed this is a beautifully framed shot with oliver here in the kitchen seeming perfectly impervious to everything that's going on and then Irene is in the darkness in, in the back of the frame, and now we move into her. Again, you can see the the elements of film noir all over Cat People, which was not it was never really defined as a genre until much later on by other critics. But you can see the emergence of film noir in the early 1940s. It was really a stranger on the third floor in 1940, which was, of course, photographed by Nicholas Muzaraka, including a particularly striking nightmare sequence that almost seems a dry run for, for this film, for Cat People and the other Luton films that he would shoot. And he would go on with Jacques Tenor to make possibly the definitive film noir and Out of the Past for RKO in 1947. So you could see this as sort of the middle of the road between Stranger on the Third Floor and Out of the Past, visually, uh, again, with the other Luton films that Musaraka would shoot. 
but it's not just the lighting. It's the shadow. It's the chiaroscuro balance between light and shadow, but also the staging. The fact that every shot is not just composed, but beautifully laid out with, with people placed in the frame and and they move around dynamically, not j but always maintaining a dynamic sense of the visual. And we are once again centered on the figure of the speared cat. Which becomes central to this point where Oliver realizes just how deeply set Arena's fears are. And that, as, as she proclaims through the film, she has never lied to him. And what's really striking is, of course... A normal person in the form of Oliver Reed here has decided in a 1942 film that they do need assistance and that he's going to send his, his wife to a psychiatrist, which is almost a, 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 a lightning leap forward in terms of realistic movie logic for this point in 1942. It's not like you had people in films in the 1940s going to psychologists when they needed mental help. You know, psychologists were meant to be figures of ridicule, like we see in, um, for example, the courtroom scenes of Mr. Deeds Goes to Town in 1936. And now we're introduced to Dr. Lewis Judd, but in shadow, of course, for the first time. And then this beautifully haunting shot of Arena under hypnosis, but under this this sort of pinpoint halo of light on her face, where only her face is seen in the complete blackness which is really visually, uh, again, underlining this sense of her separation, her outsider status, and how she is persecuted. Because here, all we see in the depths of the darkness and the shadows is just the, the inner pain of her, of her face. There is an absolute wonderful innate charm in the way that Tom Conway plays Dr. Judd here. Dr. Lewis Judd, of course, is a character who is supposed to be a little bit oily and, of course, have, have a little bit of a lecherous side. And, of course, it will be his desires for Irena that will ultimately prove his downfall. However, I've always kind of questioned that just as the the notion of is Arena a cat person or not uh, is supposed to be ambiguous. I've always felt the Dr. Judd character is a little bit ambiguous. It may just be uh, how wonderfully charming Tom Conway is in the role, but I've often felt that the Dr. Judd character is primarily uh, interested in Arena as a patient and he feels that she's trying to lie to him or lead him on, and he's determined to get to the truth. And, you know, if his sort of uh, wolfish qualities for the opposite sex also get a little bit of uh, uh, a perking up, shall we say, in the process, well, all the better for it. So I've, I've never quite felt that he is uh, completely lusting after Arena in that sense. I feel his professional curiosity is is picked, uh, you know, and and his ability to his inability to get to the heart of her problem right off the bat. She is not a typical case. And uh, again, Tom Conway is so wonderfully charming in this part. He, of course, was the brother of George Sanders. They used to call him the nice George Sanders <laughs> and uh, would take over for the uh, take over for his brother in the role of the Falcon for RKO in a remarkable series of films, some of which did have some of the Val Luton uh, crew sort of cross back and forth with. But he would appear in further Luton films, including the next film in the cycle, I Walked with a Zombie. And now we take a turn. When the door opens, Arena freezes in her cat light black coat again, and we see Alice framed within the door. And this is when the glove is thrown, and Arena realizes that Alice knows all about their problems because she and Oliver are great friends. And it's, all, of course, beyond obvious that Alice and Oliver are on an equal plane. They're on the same wavelength. They are normal people. Arena is not, and probably never will achieve that same level of rapport with Oliver. It's, of course, already underlining the fact that Alice will reveal shortly later that she's, of course, crazy about Oliver Reed, and he was just too thick-headed to not realize that. And you see here, they're, they're always framed together, uh, right there in a two-shot, and Arena's over by herself, uh, alienated once again. Uh, again, showing visually the fact that uh, she is not even 
linked to her husband. She cannot reach him. She cannot be on the same plane of existence with him, no matter how madly she wants to. And it's also very realistic and adult and forward-thinking that there are no villains here. It's not that Alice has designs on Oliver and, and wants to steal him from Arena. They are normal, sensible people, and of course, a, a normal person would ask their friend for advice when they didn't know where to turn and they didn't know what to do. It just happened that his best friend in the world was Alice. Again, the call seems to summon Arena, and now she comes to the park again at night, again in the black cat-like coat. And also must be said that Roy Webb built the score around this, this haunting lullaby melody that uh, actually came from Simone Simone herself. She was singing on the set one day, and Luton and Roy Webb couldn't come up with ideas for the score. They heard her singing this and then decided to literally make it into Arena's theme and the backbone of the score. We'll hear it all throughout the film in various stages, but almost often, almost always in this beyond... Uh, uh, a heartbreakingly sad rendition that just uh, perfectly encapsulates the, the intensive struggle that Irena is going through internally. Again, notice in the way that Simone Simone never breaks eye contact that that she she always not just in in the idea of of maintaining this sort of cat like uh, physical motions and and quirks, but the way that she uses her eyes to convey that deep set sadness. This is another lovely little bit, the fact that Oliver's so distracted by his troubles that he's screwing up his work assignments. And of course, Alice catches on this immediately with a quick, hey. Again, every action is completely believable. The fact that they need to take a break for a second and they go over to the water cooler and Alice lights yet another cigarette. And there's such a wonderful, deeply felt uh, realism to the dialogue. Oliver here coming out with a completely uh, d d d and very nakedly personal statement that literally saying I, I, that, you know, he's never been unhappy before. He's had a very, essentially a very charmed life. And maybe he doesn't, ever, he doesn't think he ever has known what love is exactly, that he's entered into a marriage and he doesn't know who he's married to, not really, and essentially that he cannot relate to Arena, but he's drawn to her strangely, and, and this sense of, of being physically attracted and, and physically drawn in to her presence, that he has to be there, that he has to touch her, he has to be in the room with her. And how this plays out for Alice, and for the first time that she physically reveals the fact that She's absolutely in love with Oliver, and she can't stand to see him unhappy. This setting up the idea we get uh, stated later on that she's the new kind of other woman, that she is not actively trying to steal away Arena's husband, but that she does actively care for him, and she does love him. Again, this, they're just at the water cooler, and it's turned into this intensely personal moment for both characters. Again, Oliver here admits the fact that he doesn't even know what love is. Which prompts Alice into this absolutely beautiful description. Another thing you have to always note, Alice always calls Oliver Ollie. She always uses the, the nickname. There's always 
an affection in her voice whenever she she literally says his name. She never she hardly ever or if not ever says Oliver. She always says Ollie. There's always the the endearment in 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 how she addresses him. Whereas Irena never can do that. That's another thing that you'll notice the more times you see the film. That even in in the smallest actions, even in the smallest little bits of dialogue, that this is a fully lived in world. These aren't just characters on a script page. They they have some sense of existence. We know what they do for a living, which is something that Luton was very attentive to. You know, he didn't want it to be just people in endless amounts of drawing rooms with endless amounts of money that didn't have a day job. Arena once again stalking the panther cage, taking the key, resisting the temptation, and as she passes, the panther howls. But again, this is setting up how Arena will essentially com- in in some fashion commit suicide but at the end of the film by later stealing the key and then using it to open the panther cage and now arena is being stalked by dr judd who is revealed as the camera pans back as arena starts to essentially prowl back she herself is being observed there's the key line psychic need to let loose evil upon the world this forms the backbone of the nightmare sequence to come that Arena will have. And here, Dr. Judd even literally again suggests how the film will end, that it, you know, not only will she let loose evil, but she has this, uh, a, an overwhelming desire for death, and even actually suggests the fact that she could un- unleash the panther cage and, and literally that be the cause of her own uh, life ending. And this sort of back and forth is, is, is suggesting, again, that, that wolfish quality that Dr. Judd apparently has with other women that Alice alluded to earlier, but that he is still a good psychologist. So in ways, Judd has a internal battle, battle with him, within himself just as Irena does. He has his own uh, s- sense of being a great doctor and wanting to help people and being the best psychologist possible, but also the the wolfish quality inside for the opposite sex and how does that balance? So it's an interesting sort of uh, I may be reading too much into it, but it's almost a, a slight mirroring of uh, the the struggle within Arena. You can already tell just visually, let alone by the very almost empty sounding, I love you, Oliver, the fact that the marriage is is not working out and falling apart. She's at first sitting down when Oliver comes over, doesn't hardly look up at him. Then she stands up, and even though they're held together in a two-shot, there's this amount of space between them that, again, visually suggests in the staging that the two people are growing further and further apart. And, of course, Irena perks up at the mention of Alice, and it's the first real time that we see any sort of emotional turmoil just immediately perk up, the first almost flash of anger. And you can hear the way she says Alice. You can hear a tone tone in her voice. must also be said that even the office can become ominous. Oliver walks up and the revolving door starts to turn by itself. Of course, it's revealed to be the cleaning lady, who is a wonderful character who, you know, again, we always remember because of the little action she has here of always wanting to brush off the cigarette ash off her uniform, which she will repeat when she comes on screen later. Oliver steps around the corner to get some coffee, but of course, it's not just a coffee shop. It's this beautifully realized cafe that feels like a location in and of itself that you could wander into. Here's the great actress Teresa Harris, who was always never given enough uh, credit for being such a wonderful presence in films, but uh, she reappears and I walked with a zombie. But even in this small, tiny part uh, of, of a waitress in the, in the little um, restaurant coffee shop, she has just, again, a great sense of being a real human being. Here's one of my favorite lines in the film. 
coming up when Alice hangs up the phone because, of course, it sounds just like a crank call, but, of course, it's Arena breathing over the line with, perchance, maybe a sort of cat-like look in the eye. Alice says, which just feels perfectly lived in and real. We all say something when we get a, a, a crank call. And, of course, the office just happens to have an office cat, because why not? Even though, as others have pointed out, it was not seen earlier. <laughs> Alice has a wonderful sort of chic sense, but she is very self-motivated and in, in the in the style of all of the women who had to do this in the years of World War II, who had to enter the workplace and the workforce and really found themselves in that way. So there's a certain liberated quality to the Alice character that I've always uh, reacted to very positively. But I, I enjoy most of all that she, like Oliver, is a truly decent person who does try to do the right thing. And this becomes all, uh, essentially another sort of counseling scene for Oliver as the downtrodden husband who doesn't know how to react to or literally open up to his wife. They are complete strangers in many ways. Of course, Irena sees them together from outside in a very ominous moment, peering through the window, and, it, and her mind jumps to conclusions because she doesn't realize Alice is the new type of other woman. And of course, she's stalking them like a cat. Once again, in the, the black fur coat. And of course, Alice would say that. It's one of the, the great little cynical nods that again builds the tension further. The score is already starting to build slightly as we go into the first of the completely iconic scare sequences of the film. This being the first of the Luton walks as they became to, came to be known where a central character takes a long night walk down somewhere alone. But she won't be alone for long as Irena starts to follow her and the first pangs of her jealousy start to overcome her supposed good nature. Now this is where the sound design of the film comes to the fore most of all, where we reduce everything down to just the two sets of footsteps and there's a different sort of sound tonality to each. Mark Robeson in his editing allows a certain pace to build, which will then drop out very shortly, just as the sound of the second step footsteps stop here as the camera stops, holds for a moment, and it takes us a moment to realize that Arena's footsteps have disappeared. And now the periods of blackness between the street lamps grow larger, now we slow down the editing. Alice starts to feel that sense of the hair standing up on the back of her neck. She looks behind her and then begins to run, and the pace starts to build again. She's not quite running yet, but, but she starts to have that, that, that fear overwhelm her rational actions. And then you hear the slight growl of the cat turn into the rushing of the air brakes, this becoming the first of the iconic Luton scare moments in the Luton films that affectionately were referred to as the bus. So the Luton bus is essentially birthing what becomes known as the jump scare, which is the ultimate bastardization of this extremely intricate technique that was absolutely revolutionary and caused 1942 audience, audiences to just completely leave their seats. Now, this is the first point at which the ambiguity of what Arena is is maybe stretched a little bit when we see the, the dead lambs inside the, um, inside the zoo area. And then we see the supposed paw prints eventually start to change over into something much more human. And then, of course, become high heel shoe prints, which is just a, a wonderfully macabre touch that I've always adored. 
And then we see Arena, obviously shaken by something that's just happened to her. And almost as if she's coming out of a trance. And of course, everyone who sees the film because of the strength of the editing and the buildup and the, the release of tension swears that they see some sort of figure or cat or leopard or panther in, in the trees above Alice. But of course, there is nothing there. The films in the cycle would build on this idea, and it became the trademark of, of the Luton horror films, uh, again, always referred to as the bus. And each film would try to have uh, about two, if not three, Luton buses in it. Again, it's interesting to see how Oliver does try frequently to reconnect with Arena. He does apologize. He does try to make up for his mistakes, which are all too human mistakes. It's not Again, there are no villains in this film. There are no heroes. There are merely only human beings. Now, Arena has once again separated herself from her husband. And she's going to take a bath, as if to try to wash the blood off that she can't get off. Once again, they're separated by the door and talking through the door. And then this heartbreaking moment of the clawed foot of the tub containing the, the weeping arena who is unable to wash the blood off. It may not be visible blood. It's not physically there, but emotionally and mentally it's there and she cannot wash it off. which leads us into this nightmare sequence, which is very, very simple, very minuscule in the usage of the optical effects, but extremely effective. It's just enough, and it's done in a way to suggest the dreamlike state of bringing in the completely surreal and yet realistic elements. So here, the king figure is actually in the visage of Dr. Judd, and he pulls the sword, and we get that line that he said earlier about the key echoing over and over and over until we now fade into the key, which, of course, the Watchman has once again, as he admitted, left inside the lock. So again, it's an idea that's been set up, and now it's going to be fulfilled because Irena will steal the key this time. She will give in to her temptation, which is something that she's been fighting the entire film. And this is something that she has just done for the first time in stalking Alice. Now she's done it again in stealing the key. It's just part of her gradual descent that takes the entire course of the film. And a beautiful fade transition from the cat to the cat figurehead of this model ship in the museum. This is perhaps the ultimate moment where Oliver and Alice are shown as, as a unified sort of couple figure and Irena is on her own. Here they, they feel she's going to get bored, so they, they're, they're sending her away. Also, she's again in, in the dark coat, whereas they are dressed in lighter colors and they are have the mutual interest in details of ships, whereas Irena is now once again feeling rejected and the outsider. Here she's beautifully framed behind a statue of Anubis. And of course, while Anubis is not necessarily a cat god, he you know, was a, a god of Egypt, ancient Egypt, and of course immediately makes one think of ancient Egypt and death and the Egyptian funeral rites. So it's sort of a, a physical specter of death to loom very large over what is now going into the second iconic scare shock sequence of the film, which is the swimming pool sequence. Even the desk clerk here has a cat and a personality because, you know, not only does she refer to Alice and everyone else as Deary, but she seems to have a sense of life of her own. Which sets up the beautiful fact that the desk cat has followed Alice down to the swimming pool area.
the idea of feeling fear in a swimming pool type scenario like this was actually inspired by experiences both Jacques Tenor and DeWitt Bodin had in, in their past experiences. This is a wonderful moment here. Alice looks down, she sees the small cat who is afraid. And then Alice starts to feel the first tinglings of fear as she looks towards the stairs until the moment where it seems as if a figure is going to pass down the stairs. You hear the noise. You see what could be a slight movement. It could be a panther. And she's already turned the lights off by this point. So it adds the dark, omin ominous feeling as she dives back into the pool in the, a last-ditch attempt to almost save herself from the unknown fear. Now, if you look closely at the lighting on Alice as her head's above water, there's a sort of similar... Uh, much much lighter but there is a sort of halo of light around her head that this sort of mimics the the light that's on Irena's face when she's under hypnosis and of course the only light source around the walls is the the refractions of the water the reflections uh, of, of the of the the lapping water causing these intricate refractions that are themselves a bit eerie amidst the swirling darkness this being the other sequence where sound plays such a key role. And there is the only moment where there's like a sort of little matted effect of something moving in the darkness. And only when the cat growls loudly does Alice scream. And it's the echoes of her scream and the high-pitched and also slightly distorted quality of it that makes it so striking. And then we hear the deep echoes of it from upstairs as, as the desk clerk becomes concerned as I start to rush down then the wonderful reveal of Arena almost with the the cat who got the canary smile as she says what's the matter and then wonderfully Alice has to try and maintain her composure because she seems completely ridiculous but she's still terrified And then Arena comes over, and Alice backs away. She won't come out of the pool just yet. And there's a, there's a sort of last little dig at Alice when, when Arena says, I'll run on, and a sort of a flat knowing quality to, to her delivery of the line. It's, it's a very knowing moment. Now Alice is completely drained here, so she asks for her towel, only to reveal that her robe is completely torn, as if s destroyed by the talons or claws of some great beast. And it's that physical manifestation, that symbol, that causes Alice to essentially push the panic button and call in Dr. Judd. Again, Alice here brings up the cat people. Dr. Judd talks about the cat people, but we've never heard Irena specifically explain this. And the fact that we have the other characters talking about and fully aware of what haunts her, it adds validity to her fears because we hear how other people react to it. And now Alice has put some stock in it because she's been so terrified now on these two instances and now has the torn up coat. She knows something has happened and all her mind can logically jump to is Irena's story about the cat people. There's a wonderful bemusement in Dr. Judd here. He says, oh, this case goes more interesting and more amusing all the time. He's already made his, his mind up, his professional mind, and he sees that he can use this to try and force things to a head and, in the process, again, appeal to that inner wolf within him. Already setting up here, Alice says, I shouldn't advise you to see her alone, which, of course, Dr. Judd completely shrugs off with a nice little knock against the wolfman where Dr. Judd sort of jokingly references the silver bullet and in the process reveals that he carries a sword cane. 
And of course, it has to be a sword cane because we've, again, from the very beginning, had the idea planted of the cat figure being pierced by the sword blade through the heart. And so after all this, it's interesting that we again go to an office scene where Dr. Judd is actually trying to do his job. And now this is the moment where the wolfish side of Dr. Judd first comes out. But again, it's interesting to note that it's possible that he's simply taking that approach, which is probably not the, um, shall we say, proper uh, doctorly approach with a, with a difficult patient to try and coax out um, you know, her to realize that her fears are unjustified. Um, but it is perhaps a particular rather drastic approach to show her that her fears are unjustified. Again, Irena says, I have not lied to you. That is, that is the key line of her entire character in the film. And here Dr. Judd is actually warning her that she is approaching insanity. He is performing the role he is supposed to do. And he does this in a way to sort of shock her or fear her, make her fear what is possible to then try and relax in a way and try to overcome her own fears, which he correctly says only she can do. There's almost a nice little bit of tenderness there where she says, for the first time, you really helped me. Maybe it's because you interest me. And then, of course, we get the reaction shot of Dr. Judd giving that little smirking stare as she, as he watches Arena walk away, which is the moment where visually we have it confirmed he does have a sort of wolfish interest in Arena as well. It's suggested and hinted at, but that's the moment where it is pretty much confirmed. There is some a little tinge of something else there. And Arena thinks she can finally be herself but finds it is too late. Oliver has realized he's in love with Alice and that his marriage is not really a marriage at all. This is the coming clean moment, as it were, for Oliver. Again, he is always trying to do the right thing, it seems. It's just not always at the right moment or the right time. Even for 1942, divorce was not something you will see commonly discussed in films. And you see Arena's glee and happiness immediately turn. And she's trying to process the rush of emotions that are coming to the fore. And again, this could be a, a scene out of a standard drama. And now Irene is starting to go into the depths of her emotions with lines like, I love loneliness. And she goes to the couch and all we can see are her eyes. And she won't even face Oliver anymore and she tells him to go. And when he leans over the couch, they're both shrouded in darkness. She's almost pleading with him to go because she's herself afraid of what will happen and what she might do. Music starts to build with a s slight rendition of the arena theme again, and then her hand goes down and her nails rip the couch as if it was the claws of cat. This is a wonderful little moment. I, that The fact that here they are to talk about possibly committing arena to a mental asylum, but we have the time of, again, the same wonderful, lively waitress and we get to know what each character has ordered, what type of pie they like with their coffee, which each one sort of symbolizes each character. And of course, simple, straight-laced, straightforward Oliver has a piece of plain 
apple pie. And this is something you will never see discussed in a 40s film. The, the fact that Oliver has to decide, will he divorce Arena so she can be committed and he's free of worry? Or will he take care of her for possibly the rest of his life and not be ever able to marry Alice like he wants to do? And again, going to, uh, underlining the fact that both Oliver and Alice are fundamentally decent people, they both decide together that they're going to do the right thing and Oliver won't annul his marriage and he will take care of Irene even if it means never being able to marry Alice. This is a wonderful, almost fourth wall breaking moment where we hear the arena theme as they're waiting around for arena to basically have a sort of intervention where they're like, we're going to have you uh, committed for observation. And Oliver goes over and turns the record off when we realize the music has been a record that Alice was playing. And Oliver just says, that's enough of that. Let's not hear that one. <laughs> The wonderful sly bit there of Dr. Judd hiding his cane so he can double back to the apartment. So it's it's an old trope that was already, uh, you know, well established by this point, but it's one I have always loved and adored. Uh, it also begins to beautifully set up suspense for the scene to come because, of course, Dr. Judd has a reason for doing that. Uh, we'll see you see it in many films and stories of course uh, also famously it appears at the end of Hitchcock's Rope in 1948 where the uh, Jimmy Stewart character does a similar move to be able to get back into the apartment later the apartment is extremely ominous in the dark of course the ultra smooth Dr. Judd has decided He's going to give himself an in to come back to the apartment and wait for Raina alone. I love the fact that Oliver Nellis in this very stressful time decide to do something sensible and try to get some work done. They go back to the office at night again. Once again, the office at night lit only primarily by the light from the draft tables, creating this tremendous but very eerie and very striking uplighting on their faces. Again, Alice answers the phone. No one's on the other end. And she starts to put two and two together. And as she talks out her thoughts, she starts to realize perhaps it's Arena, And she starts to connect it further. And that makes us, the audience, think of the impending danger that might be. Because Arena was on the line before, so it would have to be her again now. And once the lamp is turned off, we are only down to the illumination of the, of the draft tables here, which is, again, a very eerie moment. And this leads into the third shock scare sequence of the film. It doesn't get talked about as much as the first two, but it is perhaps the most emotionally charged because now it's Oliver and Alice, and it builds to a point of no return where there is literally nothing they can do. Now, of course, we do see a panther going around. It is actually dynamite, the same animal from the cage. And it was never the intention of anyone in the production team to show a cat or anything. This was really the head office at RKO. This was the unit, uh, the, the, the B producers of the B films who insisted that there had to be something visible. They weren't quite fully in on what Luton was trying to do. But in terms of direction, staging, photography, and editing, the cat is glimpsed as little as possible and hidden in the shadows. So it could be explained away as perhaps the imagination of Oliver and Alice is seeing something that's not there. And then Oliver grabs the, the, T, the T square and it forms a sort of crucifix or cross-like figure. And it's sort of out of desperation that he does this. Then absolute silence. Everything drops out. A series of quick little cuts. And then we see the door is open. And immediately the presence of evil, uh, the presence of darkness is gone. 
at least in this space. That's probably the biggest crescendo of music in the film. It does mean that uh, it is about much more an emotional uh, climax in terms of Arena confronting the two instead of just Alice. So it is a bit different from the first two scare sequences, which is probably why it's not mentioned as often as the other two. And that beautiful moment there of the open elevator door closing. And then when they get downstairs, the revolving door stops swinging. But now there's no cleaning woman there. And Alice smells the perfume of Arena, which is almost like a living thing. Then this beautiful shot here, when they come out of the revolving door, and there's this sort of shaft of light coming from the building in the fog. And of course, Alice says, I need a drink. Dr. Jed waiting in the apartment, but he, of course, is playing Arena's theme music. He's not too afraid to play the, <laughs> the record Oliver didn't want to. And the fact that he's smoking and pacing, he's obviously been there a while. He's been there the whole time. Now, Oliver and Alice have tried to reach him, and they figured he must have gone back there. Of course, they're not questioning, well, did he break into the apartment? They're setting up the suspense of we've seen what just happened. They think Irena has menaced them again, and now she's walked into the apartment and he's hung up the phone. And Dr. Judd says, I kept my appointment. And he comes close to her in this two shot where it looks like they're about to go into the traditional Hollywood clinch as he's going to bend down and kiss her, which of course he does. But the way he, he trails off in his voice talks about how, how soft she is as he gets closer and closer. And you see a, a slight, almost feline sort of smile begin to creep over Simone Simone's face. And her eyes are dead until this reveal shot where you see a certain gleam. And we only have the reaction shots of Tom Conway as Simone Simone almost retreat, it comes forward into darkness. And then it's all played out in reaction shots. Whether there is some sort of transformation or whether she merely goes mad in terms of her reaction. And then all of the fight that ensues is played out in shadow where it appears there is some sort of cat-like figure. And we also see it played out against the cat on the screen and the various cat paraphernalia of the apartment. Again, there is a, bl a brief glimpse of a stunt double there for Tom Conway, which would have been a little bit more hidden by generational laws. And then as Alice and Oliver enter and climb the Amberson staircase, they hear the, the death cry of Dr. Judd. And then we see Arena appear out of the darkness. But moving rather strangely, moving cat-like to hide behind the plant there. And looking up at Oliver and Arena, uh, sorry, at Oliver and Alice, forlornly as she's clutching her injured person. Once again, she's looking at the unified couple figure, and now all the other neighbors. And she reaches her hand up almost as if to say something, but it's really, it's really a goodbye of sorts. And she can't even bring herself; she can't even be allowed to have that moment. This is a, a nice little bit of humor where we have the, the neighbors who are almost morbidly excited by the fact that there's been a murder and then they want to go forward and they want to touch things. And of course, want, they have to admonish the other not to touch anything. And only then do Oliver and Arena notice that Dr. Judd's sword cane is broken off. That Arena must have surprised him, and there was a struggle. So Arena goes to really her home away from home, the panther cage at the zoo, now shrouded in this incredible fog. And again, she's in the black coat, but it's now draped over her injured shoulder, where you can see the, the slight bit of the sword cane starting to poke through her hand as she's covering her wound. A 
last little bit of Arena's theme, played out very somberly. She sticks the key in and is now ready to meet her fate at her own hands. And at this moment, she truly accepts what is death. And now we see the sword cane in full poking out of her back, and you see her hands start to unclench, formed into the shape of almost claws. And then for perfect B-movie expediency, the panther escapes and is immediately hit by a cab. So even it meets its own fate. And now Oliver and Arena are confronted with the black mass on the ground that is all that is left of Arena. And this could be considered supposedly trying to be ambiguous in terms of you know, seeing this in theaters, it would be a bit darker, but it is clearly the shape of some giant cat form. And we get the final payoff of the key line, she never lied to us. And the last tinge of the arena theme that is one of the moments of any film that absolutely reduces me to tears every time I see it. And we get this final quote from John Donne, which is completely fitting and nothing else like that would ever end any film of this era of this magical, incredible film that is Cat People. Cat People was released eventually uh, to incredible success, completely upending the notion that it was a simple B film. It went on to completely reverse the fortunes of RKO that was really struggling post uh, Magnificent Ambersons especially proved the validity of Val Luton's approach to making these films and uh, made him perhaps have a little bit better standing with his immediate uh, B-unit heads in terms of the fact that Cat People was a extraordinary success, frequently becoming the A feature at most theaters that booked it due to the extreme demand of the public who found out about the film via word of mouth and the intensive nature of the various shock and scare sequences and the Luton buses. It thus became the first of the nine films in this unique horror cycle that Luton would oversee. Uh, he and Jacques Tenor would go on to make the next two films, uh, which would be I Walked with the Zombie and The Leopard Man. Again, there is a, a little bit of switching around and rotating crew members around as other people would be moved in as other key individuals would work on other RKO films. So Nicholas Musaraka would move on to some films and come back. Unfortunately, RKO decided because Cat People was so successful and they had already made three films by the time Cat People was released that they would split Val Luton and Jacques Tunor and Jacques Tunor would be made to do other films. So it'd be like getting two for the price of one. Unfortunately, I think that was a mistake in a lot of ways because Luton and Tunor were great friends and understood each other perfectly and achieved such delicate balance that uh, it it does mean the films after The Leopard Man in the nine film cycle, they are different. Um, They they still have the the Luton trademark feeling and his his presence because he again would do the final screenplay uh, draft for all nine films and you can feel his presence in his hand on everything. But it is interesting to note how the different directors of the cycle uh, add to and change and contrast in terms of feeling and style. There is a little bit of stylistic shift, just as there are in between which films were written by different writers. DeWitt Bodine would come back and write uh, for The Seventh Victim, which is another Luton masterpiece. That was the first film to be directed by Mark Robeson, who Luton was so impressed with and sort of took under his wing that he fought for him and basically got him uh, the directing gig for The Seventh Victim. And Robeson lived up to Luton's belief in him immeasurably. 
But uh, Bodine would also write the sequel to this film that RKO pretty much demanded after Cat People was such a ridiculous success, which was 1944's Curse of the Cat People. And I do think you can tell a difference in style and tone in terms of the different writers. I think all the writers on the films were excellent, but you can tell a difference between the Jacques Denord directed films from the Mark Robeson directed films, for example, just as I think you can tell a difference in the story and the actual uh, characterizations between the DeWitt Bodine written films and, say, the films written by the great Ardell Ray. Uh, that's just some specific examples. You can also see it in the cinematography when you look at the films uh, shot by Nicholas Muzaraka and then the films sh shot by others. There is some, some difference, but all across the board, they all adhere to the same themes, the same style, and the same beautiful poetic tone established by Cat People. Cat People is thus the first and while I, I do find it absolutely impossible to rank uh, or uh, state the, my, my own preference in terms of the Luton canon, because I do think they're all individual masterpieces in their own ways, Cat People, I do think, is, is still the strongest one. Uh, it's not just a case of the first and best film, but just where everything came together. It's one of those magical little watershed moments in, in any sort of moment in film history where every single element came together and Val Luton culled and created and, and crafted a whole team of people that could be like-minded and who were also not top tier t um, in, in the eyes of various studio personnel. They were not working on A films, but they were all extraordinarily deeply talented people who had the ability to be that wonderfully creative within them. They just never been given the chance to shine that fully. And I think he innately understood this and used all of his background as a great writer and as David O. Selznick's right-hand man to create just one of the most original, sublime uh, m films in the entirety of horror films and in the process revolutionized the genre entirely. There really is a, 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 a point at which in the horror genre there are several key films that really the genre was never the same afterwards. There's a before and after point. Uh, you really have that with the start of the universal horror films in the sound era with 1931's Dracula followed by uh, Frankenstein in the same year. That's one point. The second is Val Luton and Cat People in 1942 and the rest of the horror cycle. And really I don't think there would be a similar landmark moment in the genre until Hammer Films started their gothic horror films with The Curse of Frankenstein in 1957, which really resuscitated the entire horror genre, uh, which was really almost dead on arrival at that point. And no one had really done anything that original since Val Luton and Cat People uh, all the way through to Bedlam in 1946. And of course, very fittingly, that year was also the year that Jacques Tenor directed the uh, incredible a very Luton-inspired Night of the Demon, which does have a number of connections to cat people that I can't help but but seeing, not just visually, but in, in things Turner would do, his, his direction, his staging, his building of tension, and his instinctive belief to maintain to this idea of never showing anything. There was a very famous battle on that film where uh, he did lose out and you do see things at the very beginning and ending of the film of Night of the Demon that uh, was is exactly the same thing as happened on the third sequence here in Cat People, where it was deemed that we had to see a cat, uh, even though it was you know fought against in every way. And just like uh, this film, Night of the Demon, what is able to overcome that? And again, that just adds to the validity of my argument that, you know, up for Jacques Tenor's greatness as a director and the fact that he should be uh, more respected and more well-known than he is, unfortunately. Ultimately, Cat People is now well-known and remembered for its place in horror and particularly for the shock sequences and the loot and buses and the whole idea of the fear of the unknown, of what lurks in the shadows. And while I am just beyond relieved that the films were rediscovered and they are available and they are somewhat known, it pains me to no end that so few people today actively seek them out or have seen the entirety of them. Because what is most surprising about these films, and some describe certain films more than others in the, in the Luton canon as not specifically being 
quote unquote horror films and the the horror element is much lesser there's no explicit gore there's no uh you know the shock sequences are there and are effective but they're looking at them under the traditional guise of what they consider a horror film to be but what's most surprising most engaging what makes these films so special is that they're so exquisitely crafted and so full of amazingly three-dimensional human characters there again as i said before what i uh, what i noticed most of all is there are no heroes and there are no villains in the luton films there are merely human beings and trying to survive in this cruel strange sometimes beautiful world that we exist in they are completely realistic and believable and even the seemingly most evil characters in the films are themselves revealed to be at the end of the day just other human beings who maybe didn't have the same breaks that we may have had everyone is similarly flawed in their own different ways and it's how they come to terms with that if they're able to live with that that determines their ultimate fate Luton was often accused of trying to inject messages into these films and would try to stress that there weren't any and eventually in a, in a famous quote that I think is the most fitting for the entirety of, of the Luton horror canon of these nine majestic magical little films is that he was once forced to tell an executive after thinking for a moment that there was a message in these films. He did have a message and that message is that death is good. I don't think there is a greater definition of why these films are that magical. You really do get a sense of the person Val Luton was. You get a sense of him in these films. And I think everyone in, in, in the crew in the Val Luton snake pit, as it was lovingly referred to, uh, of this B unit making horror films that were simply designed to cash in on universal success. They were designed to catch up with the Wolfman and what eventually became the ever dwindling in quality universal monster rallies like in films like house of frankenstein and house of dracula eventually later on in the 40s but i think everyone laser focused in on this idea and they made the best damn film that they possibly could and wound up making nine absolute masterpieces that are so beautifully crafted and ornate and exquisite to every last detail that they have become timeless and I become genuinely emotional. I am genuinely emotionally affected by almost all of these by 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 the by the end by the sheer eloquence. But uh, Cat People in particular is is was one of the Luton films that does literally start the waterworks every time I see it. I even become choked up talking about it as as I'm I'm trying not to be now. Um, I can't help it because they 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 reach me on such a deep personal emotional level because they're so intricately crafted and so painstakingly human in every single way again I, I must stress the the point that there are no heroes and there are no villains in the Val Luton horror films there's only the fear of the unknown which is the fear we all have we are all on an equal playing field and the Luton films know this to their very core and it is in Cat People where I think it's felt most of all perhaps because it is a tragedy ultimately uh, there, there is no, no saving of Arena. She knows that she is really doomed. Again, whether her fears are are real or not is really left up to to the individual audience member. Which again alludes to the fact that Luton understood that audiences are not stupid, which is the the almost the cardinal rule that so many films break. So many producers and directors and writers and, and insist on treating the audience as if they're stupid. And audiences are not stupid, and audiences do not need to be talked down to. And it is the truly great film experiences that interact and engage with an audience to such a degree that you're not only enticed to return to these films over and over and over again, but they are true experiences where time itself becomes frozen and you are completely enmeshed in the world of these characters. And uh, it's even more fascinating to know how the Luton films were put together and, and how they were made. But it becomes impossible when you're watching the film to, to note this stuff. You have to come back to them over and over and over again because you get so swept up in the story. And then it builds into the almost fever pitch moments of the famous Luton buses and the scare sequences, which are truly terrifying. And of course, absolutely nothing is seen, which is perhaps the greatest physical proof that these films are that timeless and still have the power to do that to new audiences. If you reach the end of this commentary, it should be no secret that I am absolutely obsessed 
with the Val Luton B horror films produced for RKO in the 1940s. I came to these and have ne- they have never ever left me and I find them an absolutely endless fascinating sort of vortex to fall into. I don't mind falling into the snake pit every October. I now watch these films religiously every single Halloween because they reach me on that deeply profound level. I kind of came to them backwards because I first was introduced to Jacques Tourneur via Out of the Past and also by way of that film, Nicolas Muzaraka's incredible photography. So, of course, I wanted to know what else they might have done uh, in terms of art being an RKO. I was so blown away by, by that uh, incredible noir, which is still probably the definitive film noir, that I had heard of the Luton cycle, but you know I didn't know most of the names, and I had never seen any of the films. And so I started reading further into the Luton horror films, and then I came to Cat People, and it's just become one of those life-changing moments that really make you once again realize the true power of cinema and the fact that motion pictures do have the ability to reach people in that deep emotional way that is beyond the simple enjoyment or escapism factor. There is nothing else in the world like the Val Luton horror canon. They are a complete separate crown jewel in the horror genre and of the entire cinema. They are not just great horror films. They are true works of art in every sense of the word. And it is absolutely astounding and amazing that these films could accomplish this simply by people caring that much. It has been said by a great number of people that Luton poured so much of himself into his work that uh, it was such a great stress on, stress on him that it, it practically was a motivating factor that led to his uh, early death, that he cared for these films so much that it practically killed him. And I, I do think that is true to an extent. When you read into the, the, the production history of these films about Luton staying up into in his office late into the hours of the night. People would see the the light burning as he typed away a rewriting script after script after script, pouring so much of himself into these films. You can feel it. There is I don't know if there is a film or a series of films or any sort of series where the the sense of of a person's presence is that vividly felt. And to that, I just want to say thank God these films exist because. They are some of the most affecting works of art I have ever experienced. And I hope if you've stuck with me through this whole commentary where I have tried not to babble on so terribly and tried not to simply repeat uh, the, the great works of the various horror historians and, again, the two great official commentaries by Greg Mank and Bruce Eater, which, again, if you have not heard, please take the time to go and listen to them because they are extremely uh, full of information and totally worthwhile and uh, completely overwhelm my my uh, mere attempt to uh, try and explain my adoration that will be forever undying for cat people and the entirety of the Luton films. It's a great hope of mine that more people in the modern era become more interested in classic films, and especially in the horror genre because it is so popular and the classic horror films are so often overlooked or not available to the masses unless they are sought out. And they seem typically to most horror fans of today, very foreign or alien or atypical of what is most often desired of the horror genre uh, and in terms of what it has become, that I really become quite sad that so few people seem to have knowledge or experience in the classic horror films. And people not knowing about the Luton films is perhaps the most wounding in that sense because these are so beautiful and intricate and exquisite that you just want to you know shout on the rooftops and and praise their greatness at, at every opportunity which I can't help but doing and is the reason why I wanted to do this commentary it's a commentary I've wanted to do for a while and I hope I've been able to convey uh, at least some of this film's importance and its intricate construction and its attention to detail in every single scene sequence shot setup there is not a wasted moment there is not a wasted character right down to even the most minute of the uh, bit parts and character parts there is not one aspect of this film or any of the Luton horror films that went without that attention to detail and that truly deep level of care 
for making the best possible picture that anybody could make under those circumstances and with intelligence and grace and heart. So thank you ever so much for listening. As always, I am very humbly yours, the Motion Picture Analyst, 